For the rest of you, if you can begin turning in your Bibles to the book of Nahum, chapter 1. We're going to be reading for this morning's communion meditation again from the Minor Prophets. The Minor Prophets are the last 12 books of your Old Testament, and Nahum is the seventh. So if you get to your New Testament, go left to six books, and there you'll find the first chapter of Nahum. Uh, not long ago, we finished a series as a church body on the book of Jonah. And you'll recall that the book of Jonah recounts how Yahweh sent his prophet to proclaim to the wicked city of Nineveh their coming judgment. But Nineveh believed God's message. They re- believed God's message, repented of their sin, and turned away from their violent and wicked ways And God relented concerning the destruction that he had planned for them. But a century later, Nineveh had returned to its wicked ways. And God again speaks of their coming judgment through his prophet Nahum. So this morning we want to look at the book of Nahum. And we will observe seven truths about God's character. That will help prepare our hearts to worship Jesus Christ. As we remember what he accomplished on the cross this morning. And so first, we will see that God is jealous. Look down at verse 2. A jealous and avenging God is Yahweh. Nineveh's pursuit of its wicked and violent ways and gods of its own making incited Yahweh's jealousy. God reserves all worship for himself alone. Second, we see that God is wrathful. Verse 2 continues, Yahweh is avenging and wrathful. Yahweh takes vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserves wrath for his enemies. And those who stand as God's enemies and oppose him in their sin are told that God reserves wrath for them. Third, we see in verse 3 that God is just. Yahweh is slow to anger and great in power, and Yahweh will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Nineveh and all of mankind deserve to be punished for their sin. When Yahweh, jealous for his own name, visits his wrath and anger against those who oppose him, it is the necessary outflow of his perfect justice. To leave the guilty unpunished would not be just. Should a judge allow a murderer to go unpunished? No, we would cry out against that judge. That is an unjust judge. But God is a just judge, and his perfect justice means every sin will be judged. But we also see in the beginning of verse 3 that God is patient. Verse 3 began, Yahweh is slow to anger. Nineveh's sin deserved immediate punishment. But God patiently restrained his own hand from enacting his retribution towards Nineveh. In fact, God had long endured Nineveh's sin and rebellion. And then, before executing his wrath, he graciously and patiently sent Jonah to give Nineveh an opportunity to repent and avoid destruction. And that's what we saw happened. The next thing that we'll see is in 5th, God is all-powerful. Verse 3 again, Yahweh is slow to anger and great in power. When God's anger is eventually unveiled, his enemies will learn that God is perfectly capable of executing his judgment with all power and with all sovereignty. Verse 3 continues and explains that, In whirlwind and storm is his way, and clouds are the dust beneath his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither, the blossoms of Lebanon wither. Mountains quake because of him, and the hills dissolve. Indeed, the earth is upheaved by his presence, the world and all the inhabitants in it. Yahweh is all-powerful. Sixth. We'll see that God is unrivaled. Look at verse 6. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the burning of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and the rocks are broken up by him. No rival can thwart God's wrath on Nineveh. Nobody can stop it. Nobody can endure it. Lastly, in this passage, we see 
that God is good. Look at verse 7. Yahweh is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who take refuge in him. While Nineveh will surely face destruction, there is hope for the one who takes refuge in Yahweh. God is good, and God's goodness is manifested here by Yahweh himself becoming a fortress or a stronghold to which his children can retreat to and take refuge in and escape his wrath and judgment. Like we read this, what we seen this morning, a mighty fortress is our God. Right? And these children who have taken refuge in Yahweh note also that they will be known by God. Escaping wrath and judgment, they actually enter into a close relationship with Yahweh so that it can be said of them, he knows those who take refuge in him. But, but how can this happen? How can God's justice, that, which is perfect, which demands punishment for sin, how can the Ninevite or the Jew or any of us escape his judgment? Remember as verse 6 read, who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the burning of his anger? And this rhetorical question indicts all of mankind. And only Yahweh himself can stand before God's wrath and endure his anger. And so Yahweh entered into human history as a man. Jesus, God in the flesh, committed no sin and willingly took upon himself sin's penalty by being crucified on the cross. He gave his life as a substitute for those who would take refuge in him. So to the one who turns from their sin to trust in God alone as their refuge through the sufficient provision of his son, Jesus Christ, their sin will be forgiven. It will be done away with, and that's good news. Jesus is our stronghold, our refuge, and by him we know God. We're no longer God's enemies, but children of God. As we sang this morning, the right man on our side, Christ Jesus, it is he. He is the one who can endure, and he is the one who rescues from our sin. Each week, we take a piece of bread and a cup which symbolize Jesus' broken body and spilled blood on the cross. We were enemies of God, but God became to us a refuge. We worship Jesus today remembering this. Believer, if there's sin in your life that you haven't confessed and turned from, repent. Repent. Turn from your sin and worship Jesus with us this morning as you reflect upon what Jesus accomplished on the cross. If you today are not a follower of Jesus Christ by your own admission, we would ask that as the plate comes by, that you would pass it to the next person without taking the bread and the cup. But we're really glad that you're here today because God's message is for you today. What are you depending upon to be right with God when you stand before him at the end of your life? Do you believe God will accept you because you are a good or a moral person? No, only by turning to follow Jesus and trusting in him alone and his death on the cross for sin can God's anger against your sin be satisfied and can you be reconciled to God? And we plead with you, turn to Jesus today. We would love for you to speak with anyone that you've seen up here on the stage today or one of our pastors. We'll be back at the information table after today's service. Please don't leave today without speaking to someone. Um, For the rest of you, the men in the back are going to be coming forward and serving us. Believers, as you hold the communion in your hand, remember Jesus. Remember what he accomplished on the cross. And when you're prepared, go ahead and take communion on your own. And Scott will come up in a few minutes to lead us in prayer. Men, please come forward.